Hey, it's Whitney from EcoVeganGal.com and welcome back to another live Q&A. Today I have guest Jason Robel on again due to popular demand. We have some great questions for you and we cannot wait to hear what you have to ask us live. So for those of you who are brand new, I'm gonna do a really quick intro and if any of you have been watching regularly, you can either just sit through it, it'll be about three minutes if you're watching live, you don't really have a choice. <laughs> and uh, if you're you're watching the recording, you can actually skip forward using the time code in the description field. So the way these work is I do these every Saturday afternoon and I am taking questions that I've received over the years and answering them often with myself or with another guest like Jason. And uh, these are all submitted from you. So I will, there's a link right down below that you can submit questions for future Q and A's if you don't have a chance to ask live. Live. But the reason I do these live is because at the end, after we've finished answering the kind of prepared questions, then we open it up to any questions from you. So you can tune in any Saturday, ask whatever you want about healthy vegan living, eco-friendly living, and we'll do our best to answer it. And you can do that through going to google.com slash plus symbol eco vegan gal clicking on the event and then looking for the Q&A app that usually shows up on the right hand side when you're watching these videos and you can just type your question in at any point during the Q&A. So even if it's right now and you want to ask, you can do that. Um, and let's see what else. I'm getting a little off track in my head. <laughs> um, lots to think about here. Okay, so for if you're watching the recording of this and you want to ask a question for the future, not only can you use that link down below, but you can also ask your question via voicemail through something called SpeakPipe, which allows you to record a voice message of you, and I can hear your voice. It's really neat. And otherwise, I just recommend that you ask all your questions in the, one of those two ways, the form or in uh, the speak pipe. If you ask on YouTube, it often gets lost and I don't see it. But speaking of YouTube, it's a wonderful way to comment and to talk with other people, to add your input on things. So please use YouTube once this has been recorded to interact with me and other people. All right, I think that's it. All of the links that we talk about today will be included in the description field below. And I did mention that the time code will be linked there as well. So you can jump forward to different sections. These, of course, are on the longer side. So if you don't want to watch the entire thing, you can just jump forward in time. And if you're thinking about why would you just sit here and watch this, a lot of people like to listen to these. So you can listen as you're doing other things around the home, as you're exercising, as you're driving. Just be sure not to look at the screen in that case. Of course, you don't have to just sit and watch. We really want to make this kind of like an interactive podcast in a lot of ways, but most of this will just be talking. All right. Shall we get started? Let's do it. So Jason, do you want to introduce yourself for anybody who's brand new to you? Yeah, so uh, my name is Jason Robel, and it's, well, you can see it's spelled W-R-O-B as in baby, E-L. A lot of people mispronounce it, so I feel the need to spell it. But uh, I've been professionally working as a vegan and a raw food chef for about nine years now. I also have a YouTube channel called The J-Row Show, where I've got right around 250 videos, most of them recipes. You okay with that, T? Yeah, spilling it on my on my <laughs> oh, white dress. Oh no. I got to be careful. Yeah, it's hot. Well, when you want that tea, it's just so easy. Um, so other than hosting YouTube, uh, I also uh, am the host of uh, How to Live to One Hundred on the Cooking Channel. It's the first vegan plant based cooking show on a mainstream network, and um, I love just collaborating with Whitney. I think I've done the most collaborations with Whitney over the past uh, two or three years now, and just here to really share my experience with food and nutrition to uh, help support you in your journey toward a happier and healthier lifestyle. Awesome. And make well, it fun too. Well said. And we just did a, a video together about how to eat raw food on the budget. The reaction was really good to that. I saw the comments. Yeah. People were digging it. Yeah. And you can also see it, the superfoods on a budget that we did a few weeks ago too mm -hmm. as part of the Healthy Organic Vegan on a Budget series. I haven't told you this yet unless you saw on Facebook. Is the ebook done? Well, it's not done, but the rough draft is done. Really? My first rough draft. And I can't I believe how it. long it is. It's kind of crazy. Can I guess? Or are we not allowed to divulge? Well, if I guess, like, depends, on the money? It depends, though, because it depends on how, what format you're looking at it in. Okay, but if in I were word, looking... in Word, in Microsoft Word version, how long do you think it is? 112 pages. 
That's actually like almost insanely accurate. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's like 115. Is it really? <laughs> yeah. Not Which bad. is crazy. I Not can't bad. believe I wrote a book that long. That's actually remarkable. Congratulations yeah, on that. That's awesome. It's crazy. Somebody and got I, excited. I can't wait to. Yeah, she gets excited whenever people yell. Yeah. So yes, that the Healthy Organic Vegan on a Budget ebook will be out as soon as possible. I currently have my amazing editorial team reviewing it this weekend. I hope to at least do pre-orders or uh, pre-sales. Uh, on Wednesday, I'm aiming for. Wow, rad. And uh, who knows? Maybe the book will be out on Friday. It depends on how quickly I can format it and finish editing it and all of that. But yes, it's very, very exciting. Thank you for for being part of it. You might. You're gonna have to put her up on your lap. Evie wants to be part of part of the action as usual. Yes. Eco vegan dog. Yes. All right, fine. We have another guest on this week's yes, Q and A. Yes, two guests today. She'll be like, oh, so what kind of um, sandpaper do you like to use? And she'll go rough, rough. That was a bad dog joke. That was really bad. <laughs> okay, Moving let's get on. started with more serious things. Although, you know, dogs are serious. Any books are serious. Okay, you ready for the first question? I actually didn't tell him any of the questions that he's going to get today. This is exciting. But you're really good at answering things off the top of your head. Improv so. is a specialty of mine. Okay. It's true. So Rachel asked, can you give me the skivvy on probiotics? What are they, why are they good, their purpose? What are they a good so source of? I, or what are a good source of probiotics? I know kombucha is a good source, but frankly, it kind of weirds me out. St strains of live bacteria, haha, <laughs> um, that sounds kind of alien-like. <laughs> I know I'm now a nine month vegan and I'm finally getting brave enough to try it, convince, convince me. Well, I can, you. I, can use, mm. I can convince you on kombucha because I'm a massive fan. If you go to my other channel, What a Vegan Eats, I actually have a, several videos of me talking about my favorite brands. And each different brand has a completely different flavor. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you don't like kombucha because you tried one, try at least three more. And I'd be happy to, well, I'll just tell you right now. So my number one for years and years has been Revive. I love Revive so much, and for many reasons I talk about on my on the What a Vegan Eats channel. There's a whole video about it. And then my second favorite would probably be, um, oh gosh, what is it called? <laughs> Obviously, it's not. Reeds. No, no. no Reeds. Reeds is okay. Reeds has fallen a few notches. Yeah, okay. Reeds is really okay. exciting in the beginning, but it, actually, Reeds is a good transition kombucha because it tastes a lot like ginger ale or ginger beer or something. So it's not, the kombucha taste is not that strong. So that might be a good one for mm -hmm. you to try. Why am I blanking on, I can't, I can't believe this. My, I don't You're know where the kombucha my head queen. Is. I know, well Revive is just like the thing. I, yeah. I like bucha a lot. And um, I'm just not a massive fan of, of Synergy or um, what's the other name? That, GTs? GTs. The, that's kind of the easiest one to find. They've, you know, they've been around for the a longest. long time. Yeah, I just, I think they're okay. But if a lot of people experience them and they're very vinegary, they're very sour, bitter, they're very strong smelling. And if that's your first experience of kombucha, I really recommend trying a few. I would say Reeds. Reeds is usually very inexpensive and easy to find. That's a, a great first one. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite kombucha? I'm not really into kombucha anymore. I, I got to be honest, I burnt myself out by drinking a lot of kombucha between probably 2005 and 2009. And I just, I rarely drink it. I, I just, I, for whatever reason, I really lost interest. But what I really love to do on the probiotic tip now is, um, is yogurts, vegan yogurts, especially coconut yogurts are something I do a lot. Um, I'll also do, uh, there's a drink out there, a coconut kefir called Kivita. Yes. So I love yes. kefirs. Coconut kefirs, coconut yogurts are really my go-to as far is, as probiotics. Is it kefir or is it kefir? If you want to get like old school, like the or, the origin of it, which is I think Middle Eastern, it's kefir. So kefir is like, the American you know, eyes. it's like kefir Sutherland. No, it's kefir. <laughs> it's kefir. So anyway. Uh, now that we cleared that up, I, I just love the go-to and, and coconut I feel is such a great base because it mimics really the creaminess and the density, especially in yogurt form or in whipped probiotics that people are used to. Yeah. So if you're not into uh, uh, kombucha, there are things like the kefir, like the yogurts. Um, there's another great company out there called BioK, which is yes. a liquid probiotic that is really, really packed 
with a high probiotic count. But and answer, also good belly. Good belly is great too. Good belly makes a probiotic coconut water that's really phenomenal. You can drink it just like you would coconut water yeah. as and, a beverage. And the reason you would want to incorporate probiotics into your healthy lifestyle, um, especially as a vegan, is, is there's different kinds of flora in your gut. There's the beneficial flora that helps proliferate, have better digestion, actually helps boost your immunity, uh, creates a really healthy intestinal environment. And then there's not so good flora. Florida, sorry, flora. Florida. Yes, there's not so good. There are good parts of Florida and there are bad parts of Florida, much like probiotics. Um, but with flora, there's also things like pathogenic bacteria that if you eat things like really unwashed greens or perhaps you have some kind of food poisoning, that can be another kind of gut flora that can wreak some havoc. That can cause bloating. It can cause uh, intestinal distress. So probiotics really help to restore the balance in your gut. And we all have bacteria in our gut. So even though it might sound alien to you as you described, we have bacteria not only living in us, but here's a really interesting one. We have millions of bacterial microbes all over our skin. So it's not as alien as you might think. It's actually quite natural. Yeah. Um, and the thing is, by eating healthier, by eating alkaline, by having probiotics in your diet, you're going to maintain a really healthy balance, not only on your skin, but also in your internal organs as well. You know, you left out one of your favorite sources of probiotics. Fermented foods. Oh, f of course. Of course. Yeah. Krauts. Sauerkrauts, fermented vegetables, kimchi, escabeche, kimchi, love fermented. I can't even remember if I that. We pro we're probably going to eat our fair share of it today because we're going to an Oktoberfest, a vegan Oktoberfest. Yes, which will be we're kraut heavy, I'm yes. sure. Oh, I can't wait. Well, you'll need that because, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, it's funny. The Germans are very smart with sauerkraut yes. because when you're loading up, they traditionally eat a lot of meat, but and breads, breads and all that stuff. You know, these heavy foods, sauerkraut is really helpful in helping you digest it all. Plus, Absolutely. it tastes really good. Absolutely. So, sauerkraut is not just something to enhance the flavor, but it also really helps your whole digestive system. Yeah, it breaks down proteins, breaks down heavier foods, breaks down starches. So, fermented vegetables, really easy to get now. Um, even Trader Joe's, I actually tried ah. for the first time. They have a sauerkraut. So, That's okay. really, really easy to obtain pretty much wherever you go now. Do you have any probiotic brands? So you're really into bio, okay? Have you ever come across like any other capsule forms of, of probiotics that you've liked? Oh gosh, any there was brands? there was yeah, there was a powdered um, uh, uh, there was a powdered brand I was taking years ago, and I can't, so it was a vegan strain, and I can't remember right now. We forgot about Sunbiotics too. And the last time Jason was on the oh, Q and A, yeah. there's Sunbiotics. They make probiotics. They're a very high vibe company. So. I would recommend them. I haven't. I have their probiotics, but I haven't started taking it. I don't think. I've been taking. Um, I think is it Mega Mega Foods probiotics mm -hmm. for a little while. It's such a subtle difference. It's hard to tell from brand to brand. It is. So you kind of have to go with your gut. <laughs> pun intended. Uh, and feel it out. See, see, you know what's on sale, and what. Look at the the amounts of microorganisms within them, and maybe do a little bit of research. I just I haven't felt that faithful to one brand. I love Symbiotics, as you can see from that past video that we did. They not only make probiotics in like the capsule pill form, but they also make the sun, the probiotic chocolates and the probiotic almonds. So there's different ways to get them mm -hmm. into your diet. Now there's one last really interesting thing on this tip. We were just in New York City um, traveling through for Expo East and we stopped at Juice Press, which is a really cool chain yeah. in New York City. And they actually have a probiotic coming out now made from flowers or flower nectar, but they're sending me a sample. Are they? So maybe I can bring that or you can feature yeah. it on the next Q&A. Is but it I'm, called probiotics or there's a yeah, V Yeah, probiotics yeah. and it's totally vegan. It's a vegan strain, but apparently it's made from some flower extract. I don't know the process yet. I'm gonna research more when I get the product, but that's something I've never heard before. So yeah. it'd be interesting to start trying that and see what effect it has on, on my body, see if I feel any different. It's so, very exciting. Yeah. Well, you just gave a good segue into the next question. Okay naturally. So Amy said, I'm traveling to New York City and there are so many vegan places I want to visit while I'm there, but I don't want to overwhelm my family who are not vegans. <laughs> they left it up to me to plan for what we will be doing, shopping and eating. Do you have any suggestions on places that would appeal to both? I was thinking of visiting Mooshoes and then taking them out to eat at Camp kind of 79, except these are both vegan places. Do you have any additional tri tips for traveling as a vegan? 
Um, well, we've just finished traveling. I yeah. literally just got back a few days ago, and you were traveling with me part of that. Mm -hmm. So let's start. We went to New York City twice. We went out of our way to go there twice, yes. and it was so well worth it. We actually did go to Candle 79. That was my first time since the only time I've been there, which is when I did a video review way back in the day Five when I first ago, right? started. Yeah. Wow. So it was really great to go back. I've been to Candle Cafe a, a few times since then, and there's also a video on that. But it was phenomenal. I mean, it's such a beautiful place and great experience and a diverse menu, and they have a gluten-free menu. and and just so many options for everybody. I mean, it's definitely a place you can take non-vegans. Easily, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I think first of all, if, if, you're go if you have a limited amount of time and you want to just maybe sample as many places as possible. Which the is what we did. <laughs> which is, we, we had six hours and we packed several places in. Um, we'd go to the East Village. East yes. Village is the mecca of now, veganism in New York City. Candle 79 down. is not in the East Village. It's, no. in the, it's in the Upper East Side. Yeah, Upper yeah. East Side. But the East Village, I agree. If you have to cut out Candle 79. East Village is Mecca. They've got an amazing vegan ice cream shop called, which used to be called Lula's. It is now called uh, Blythe Ann's. That's in the East Village. If your uh, parents, your family are ready for ice cream <laughs> that is healthy but tastes like regular ice cream, it's mind blowing. Um, there's great restaurants there. There's Angelica Kitchen. There's Caravan of Dreams. Beyond Sushi. There's Beyond Sushi. In Gramercy Park, just a little bit north of there, a few blocks, is uh, One Lucky Duck or Pure Food and Wine. Yep. Um, if you want to maybe go toward the more, say, traditional, like, um, mock meat side of things, if you're concerned that maybe they want something, like, more meaty, uh, you could try Red Bamboo, which is in the West Village, yes. which has amazing yes. uh, soy salmon yes. steaks and different burgers and hoagie. I mean, the menu is amazing if you want to go a little more dense and a little more meat-like. But literally, you can go on Happy Cow or you can just do a search for New York vegan restaurants and it, It's insane. It, it literally gonna, fills up the screen. Like, you cannot even see a piece of land. It's all just little dots yes. from where you can go. But I wanted to interject, if you're going with non-vegans and you don't want to make it entirely vegan, we were both shocked at how many places around the city have vegan menus. Options, okay? yes. There's a place, we went to Angelica Kitchen. Mm -hmm. Right next to it is what, a hundred something year old 102 Italian? 102 year old Italian restaurant. That said, right on the top, like this is an old school traditional Italian restaurant that said like traditional and vegan Italian. Yeah, they had a whole separate section of vegan options at so this 102-year-old Italian restaurant. And th this is so common. I mean, you walk down anywhere, especially in the East Village, it's like every single block has vegan options. So you can easily go to a place and find something for everybody and not make it like just about veganism. And I can understand this. My parents are like that with me too. They don't they they like to kind of roll their eyes at the veganism thing from time to time and and are thinking like do we have to go to another vegan restaurant so for them it feels good to go to a place where they can still eat whatever they want and i can still eat what i want even though obviously i'd love them to eat exclusively vegan with me but you know you do what you can yeah and there's a ton of great indian restaurants there that have vegan and non-vegan options but i feel um, like we're overwhelming so if we had to limit it to one place i it's kind of impossible. I, you can't. With, I'm with, sorry, I can't answer New that York question City. because you, you just have to go with what cuisine you want. Yes. Honestly, yep. if you want comfort food and what area you're in and what area you're yeah. in. I mean, you can't lose. For my money, and at Los Angeles, I love you. New York is still my number one city for oh, yeah. not just vegan dining yes. but healthy dining. Yes, it's insane. Organic dining. Now, in terms of retail stores, Mushu's is phenomenal. Yeah, it's so fun. They're so nice. And uh, Vote Couture in Brooklyn if yes. you can make it over there. Oh, absolutely. You have to go there. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. We also went to that phenomenal Eco Home Store, which is like, well, it's not oh. just Eco, but. Yes, ABC Home. Wow. That's also in the East Village, really close to Actually, Grammar Food and Wine. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But right by Union mm -hmm. Square and our park, Square Park. Union Square. Yes. And this place is unbelievable it is like anything you could possibly want for your home and there's so much 
eco-friendly stuff in there. There's a lot of like organic and healthy. They've got a huge book section and almost all the book cookbooks in there were vegan. It was really, I mean, that's not really their aim, I guess. They're just kind of this upscaled natural living influenced place. Yeah. But it's something that everybody will love. Even if you're not that into home stuff, there's just so much there. They've got the whole bottom floor is all like food related. A kitchen related they've got a section a floor for every part of your home uh -huh. and it's just magical it's got a such great vibe in there and they've got a huge beauty section I I'm so thankful that you took me there because it's I could have spent the whole day in that store so yeah it's pretty special and, and again that's a great place that's a great in-between type of a place absolutely I don't know I mean I, I usually go to New York to eat not to shop so Maybe other people in the comment section can let us know if you have any other vegan stores or uh, places that have vegan options within them that can accommodate everyone. And of course, your favorite restaurants in the comments, we'd love to, to hear too. Uh, we, we'll probably circle back around to the, the travel question later on or in another video. I actually talked about this a bit in the last Q&A or two Q&As ago with my sister. But the next question comes from Cindy. And this is a nice compliment to the last one. My boyfriend and I will be vacationing in LA and I want to, let's see, I, I figured you'd be a great person to ask what are the must place visits, <laughs> must visit places in LA. Where could we get some really good vegan food, maybe some awesome cafes, health stores, and do you know of any festivals that you can go to? I, I believe I missed the time period that Cindy was here, but for anybody in the future, I actually have a whole video that I've filmed and edited literally a year ago that's right that's and right. i can't believe i haven't put it out it's so silly but just so much has gotten in the way of it i'm going to get that out as soon as possible because i took you the people you as the viewer around to all my favorite places and of course things have changed because now we have a few new restaurants mm -hmm. but until that video comes out let's summarize it we talk about this all the time people always ask what are your favorite places in la yeah we'll just go back it's and forth. hard but i mean i'm gonna i'm gonna go with the obvious which is still my my favorite uh is shojin yeah. which is a vegan sushi place in downtown los angeles in little tokyo and in culver city ultra gourmet uh really creative delicious flavor combinations and not only that the owner sugu and his staff they put so much love and intention into the food you can feel it and yeah um, for a lot of people that are like, oh, is it just avocado rolls? I get that all the time. Cucumber out. No, it's it's like sauteed tempeh and these gravies and these chipotle mayos and these burdock. They're doing flavors and ingredients you've never seen before. So that'd be my first place. Oh to go. yeah, I need to pull up a picture on this. It's it's so phenomenal and and it's continuously oh, been. There you go. Here's a real, there you here, go. This is all you need. Is to that see. the dynamite roll? Oh yeah. Yes. That that about explains it right there. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't even look vegan. Beautiful sauces and like they use all these different types of meat alternatives from like tempeh and tofu to like mushrooms and seitan. All sorts yeah. of just crazy roots and things and and is this experience is unlike anything else. I would say if you couldn't go anywhere else in LA, it would be Shojin. Absolutely. It is just so phenomenal. But there we Similar to New York, we have an abundance in almost every different part of LA and it keeps expanding. Mm -hmm. We have Gracias Madre, which is phenomenal. Mexican Organic Vegan. Cafe Gratitude, which is like if you really want something super healthy, if you want raw and cooked food. We have a number of raw places out here. We've got Planet Make. Raw. Make is, yeah, Make would probably be, that's in my video, and Make would probably be my favorite place. That's the ultra gourmet raw yeah. place here in LA with and Matthew Kenny. The experience is just phenomenal. Let's see what else. There's Sage. Sage is really nice. Mm -hmm. Real Food Daily is nice. I mean, then we've got all these little smaller places and Ooh, one of our favorite new places we're really into Thai food and spicy food yes. is Sadha. Yes, Sadha is great and Sadha. it's affordable and flavorful and really unique. One of the most unique vegan Thai place I've ever been to. And that it got its roots from Bulan Thai, which is really solid, but it's more of a typical vegan Thai. We could go on and on, but again, if if you had to pick just one place, I would say Shojin. If you're completely raw, I would say Make. Mm -hmm. That probably that's a good overview. Up. I mean, we could go on and on and oh, on about yeah. this topic. And that really. the video I have there now in the video, I also cover some non 
uh, restaurant type places. So oh. we didn't go to Viva La Vegan because I don't know if that was open at the time that, that wasn't we filmed open, the video. Yeah. But Viva La Vegan, well, not in Santa Monica. Mm -hmm. They have two locations, one in L.A. proper, Santa Monica area, and then one kind of way out, a huge like warehouse style vegan place. And that is definitely worth going to. Load up, especially if you're, you know, you have room in your, your luggage to carry some things back. You'll get phenomenal vegan goodies there. Just any type of food you could possibly want. The other place though, of course, is Air One. Yes, Air One Gotta is really Air wonderful One. if you, and last since, I mean, we have a lot of really great natural markets out here. In terms of non-perishable goods, Spice Station is really fun. Oh, if you're into yeah. spices, that's in the video. But in terms of like, Moot Shoes is coming out here too. So if you want the shoes, one to, have they opened yet? Not yet. They open really, really soon. Yeah. Anytime now. I don't know any other retail stores I'm trying to think. Mm. Are we forgetting something really no, obvious? No, not so much. I mean, there's little stores like in Santa Monica, there's a few natural living stores that have like, um, like hemp and eco-friendly clothing, like a natural high. There's another place called Vital Hemp, which actually have really comfortable like hemp and organic cotton and bamboo clothing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think Moose Shoes is going to be the king when it yeah, opens. Yeah, we don't we don't really have anything else like that mm -hmm. right now. So even eco home stores, I mean, they're they're a few scattered, they but go. yeah, I like to go to secondhand stores a lot. That's my favorite thing, and I would definitely recommend that in LA because we have an abundance of secondhand stores. I love Crossroads. My my entire outfits, almost all my outfits, are from places like Crossroads and Buffalo Exchange, and uh, we also have. Just go to Melrose Avenue, and yeah. you'll find not only vegan restaurants. We've got Crossroads. Yeah, not to there. be confused with that Crossroads. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, different Cross. Right, there's Crossroads, the restaurant, Crossroads, the secondhand shop. But Melrose has both, and cafes. Number one, the only place I will recommend is Earth Cafe. That's also my video. That is my top cafe I've ever been to. I love Earth Cafe, and that is a must, must. Um, yeah, and Melrose is just fantastic because you've got Earth, you've got Crossroads, the restaurant, Crossroads, the secondhand store, you've got Boulogne, you Gracias have Madre. Gracias Madre, you have M Cafe. I mean, Melrose Avenue, if you had to go one place, so we said East Village in New York, if you had to go one place in LA, it'd probably be Melrose or Santa Monica. Yeah, or even Sunset Boulevard in Silver Lake and Echo Park. Yeah, but. I don't know, Melrose is, there's a lot more going on and there's something for everyone there. True. Okay. Anonymous, she didn't want her name to be said, wanted to know, is tempeh actually healthy for you or is it just healthier than tofu? Is tempeh actually healthy for you? Well, that's a very uh, subjective evaluation. It depends if you can tolerate soy, number one. I can tell you from my experience that uh, the the response in my body and many people I've talked to and clients is that fermented soy has a different effect in their body. If you are not allergic to soy, this is what we're talking about if you don't have a soy allergy, right? If you can tolerate soy, I find that tempeh is much healthier than tofu simply because it's fermented, okay? So you have a more abundance and of- And less processed. And less processed, yeah. right? Because tofu is an extremely intensive process to um, create a soybean cake. If you look at tempeh, you can actually see the actual soybeans still in um, the tempeh cake itself. So they use a different culture. It has probiotics in it. It has an abundance of B vitamins. It's high in protein, much like tofu. I find that my body digests and assimilates tempeh completely differently than tofu. Oh yeah. Even sprouted tofu. When I eat sprouted tofu, I get a tummy ache. I feel weird. Uh, I rarely, rarely eat tofu. I mean, it's an extremely rare occasion. Tempeh, I eat all the time. I love it, again, because it's a high protein source, it's high in iron, great source of B vitamins, and it's got probiotics in it. It's got that great fermented culture. Um, I love using it for things like f uh, fake chicken salad. It tastes amazing. Uh, you can make tempeh bacon. You can crumble it into casseroles. You can use it in sandwiches. It's an extremely versatile uh, soy product, much like tofu, in that if you marinate it, it really soaks up the flavor of any marinade. So do I feel it's healthier than tofu? Yes, if you can tolerate and enjoy soy products without discomfort. But do you feel like it's healthy in general? That was more the question. Is it healthy on its own? Or yes. is it just healthy compared to tofu? Yes, if you find a non-GMO organic tempeh, yes, it is a healthy product. Yeah, and you know, it, it's got tons of protein. It's fermented, so yes. it's got the, uh, the probiotics in it. Mm -hmm. It's got various other vitamins and minerals in it. And yeah. uh, 
it's just incredibly flavorful. So it's definitely when again, it all depends on what your your definition of healthy is. But if you're looking at it compared to not only tofu but other meat alternatives, it's certainly healthy because it's just barely processed. If I don't even know if you would consider it processed. Well, I mean, there was processing yeah. involved, but to your to your point, Whitney, I, I would say out of all of the um, uh, um, meat analogs or protein sources, high protein sources, it's it'd easy. be my number one choice. Oh, sure. I mean, yeah. cleaner than seitan, tofu, 100%. any of the meat alternatives made from wheat and from uh, soy. So Yeah, and especially when you combine it's very that. very simple. Like you combine that in a quinoa bowl, say with fermented <sighs> veggies on top. It is so good for your gut. It's yes. so high in protein. Uh, we just, I, I love it. I eat it all the time. Yeah, it's very, very flavorful and you can do a lot with it. I am still very sensitive to soy. So unfortunately, even tempeh, I have trouble eating. So I don't eat very much. So if you're sensitive to soy, just have a little bit here and there. A great point made by Talia Furman in the last Q&A was about introducing small portions of certain foods. And I find that when I have small amounts of tempeh, I can still really enjoy the flavor and the whole experience of it without it really disrupting my body too much. So if you're in a similar position, I would try that. Moving on to a similar question there, Elizabeth asked or says that she's a longtime vegetarian and went vegan within the last half year or so. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> she loves eating a plant-based diet, but is now wondering whether gluten is a good thing to be consuming. So I actually just finished editing a section in my book about this because I really want to address the gluten. I should probably include a section about soy in there too. <laughs> <laughs> but gluten and soy are two hot topics for me and, and something that I avoid. And so it, most of the content you'll see on Eco Vegan Gal will be gluten and soy free. And that's because I personally have trouble digesting it and I just don't feel good from either. And I know a lot of people are, are in similar positions. But also because I feel like when you are avoiding gluten and soy, it's a little bit easier to eat less processed food. Now that's not necessarily always the case because certainly you can eat a lot of gluten-free foods that are highly processed, high in sugar, low in fiber, low in nutrients and all of that. So you first have to kind of figure out what your definition of gluten-free is. It do, it's similar to vegan in that just because you're not eating something doesn't mean that you're eating healthy or that it's ideal for your yes. body. So I would say Generally, there's a very small portion of the population that's allergic. It's it's like 1% have celiac disease. And then there's been debates about whether gluten sensitivity is actually a real thing. Mm -hmm. From my firsthand experience, I feel very sensitive to gluten, and I've ruled it out by so much experimenting in the past four years. But I've never been tested, so I don't really know. I just, I, I just have whatever reaction to it, so I, that's why I choose not to eat it. So number one would be experimenting to see if you're in that similar position. Otherwise, I would say there's no reason to avoid eating gluten if you're not sensitive to it because you can eat a variety of delicious whole grains. I mean, there are plenty of times I wish that I could eat gluten because I miss out on really wonderful whole wheat products out there or what barley or rye or mm -hmm. sourdough or all Spelt. these phenomenal whole grains that mm -hmm. you can still enjoy. So I would say you have to figure it out for yourself. Get tested if possible. Do a lot of trial and error. And if you're not sensitive, enjoy gluten grains when they are in their whole unprocessed form. And sprouted grains are phenomenal too. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, I have not come across too many benefits of being gluten-free unless you have a sensitivity to it. Um, but it, this is su such a debatable topic and can go on and on. Do you have any other insight to add to that? I do, yeah. There's a distinction to be made between uh, commercially grown American wheat mm -hmm. and heirloom varietals that have been grown for centuries in places like Europe and Canada. And I'll give you a case in point. Doing a lot of research into this, in a lot of European countries that are growing organic wheat, they're using the same seed derivatives that they have used for hundreds of years, generations, right? So those seeds have not been genetically modified. They haven't been hybridized either. So I did an experiment about um, maybe a year and a half, two years ago, where I decided to do two things. I went out and I found, because I've been doing uh, mostly gluten-free, nearly 100% for since 2005. That's actually one of the reasons I went raw back in 05, oh. is because I was feeling so just heavy and bloated and, and gross on grains. So I actually cut out all grains 
for several years of my life, all grains, completely. Kind of like paleo. A little bit yeah. like paleo. But what I found was I decided to research this and do an experiment. So as I was finding out about the European and Canadian wheat and how differently it was grown from the different seeds, non-hybridized, I tried an Italian uh, organic wheat pasta. And I did not have the bloat reaction at mm. all. And then I found another company that we love called One Degree Organics. Yes. And they make these great, amazing, not only organic, but veganic cereals and, and grains breads. and breads that are grown in veganic soil, no animal products mm. in the soil. And what they do is they have total transparency. You can find out who their farmers are, what their growing methods are, and they're using wheat from farmers and also an, an ancient wheat called Khorasan that these farmers in Canada have been growing for generations. Again, heirloom seeds, non-hybridized. So I tried their bread that they sent. I'm like, oh my God, am I actually eating wheat bread? So I toasted it and I tried it. I did not get the reaction to it. So it all depends on how the wheat is grown, how it's stored, because a lot of it is in the storage. They store a lot of the wheat in these giant silos where what grows there? Mold, fungus, and yeast. So it could be the intrinsic genetic modification and hybridization of the grain itself, or often they're finding it's the way it's stored and how moldy and fungusy it gets. Yeah. So if you get really clean wheat and it's, it's non-genetically modified and it's heirloom, your body may have a different reaction like mine did. Yeah. I didn't have that inflammatory response. Right. Yeah, you have to experiment with that. I find the same thing. When I eat sprouted breads or I eat one degrees bread, well, is one degree sprouted? I can't remember. I can't remember if it's sprouted. It is. It t it tastes really good. <laughs> number one. Oh yeah. And number two, it 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 definitely has a different effect on my body. So again, similar to tempeh, I can have that type of gluten in small amounts, which is really nice to know. But I haven't I haven't done an entire elimination experiment with the you know breads one bread versus the other. So you know it's it's just going to depend on you and and your bio individuality and. Lots of experimenting and, and talks with your doctors. Okay, so we're going to take questions in just a few moments, so get them ready. You can type them into the Q&A form within Google Plus at any time. And again, if you're just tuning in, you can do that at google.com slash plus symbol eco vegan gal. Click right on the event that we're doing right now and open up the window and look for the Q&A app on the right-hand side. You can type in your question or your comment if you have anything to add. We cannot see your questions if they're posted just on the event page or on YouTube. Okay, so last two questions fall into a similar category. Okay. So Catherine asked, I'm hoping you can address the topic of flu shots. Flu season is coming up and I just recently started working in a healthcare facility. I've never had a flu shot before and I do not wish to get one. Although now with my new job, I'm concerned since I'll be around potentially sick people. I like to think I have a strong immune system. I'm concerned about the shot because I've never gotten it or needed it. Am I being foolish? Are the flu shots relatively safe? What are your thoughts? Do you want me to open this up or you want to start? <laughs> this is a this is an intense intense subject matter and you know a lot of people feel very very strongly so first I want to begin by saying you know we're trying to address this from personal opinion and experience we're not doctors we are are not scientists or researchers in the medical field so we're really just addressing this from our own personal experiences and knowledge and research and we definitely don't want to start a fight with anyone about this but I have haven't had the flu shot in I don't know how long and I feel like I am it's more useful for me to strengthen my immune system and be really mindful about where I am and who I'm around so a perfect example is the airplane right and now we've got Ebola this whole issue going on right I was just reading about Ebola and airplanes and all that that's a whole other topic but it was interesting to read because of this concern you know am I if I'm around people that are sick am I going to get sick myself? And it all depends. Ebola apparently, yeah, I'm not even gonna get into Ebola, but I, I found a lot of interesting information about that. Anyway, so about the flu specifically. Now, flus, colds, whatever, oftentimes I feel like people that get the flu or colds, it's usually a result of them not eating very well, not living a healthy lifestyle, unless their immune system isn't doing very well. And then they're around other people. So if they're at a, a job or something 
where other people are sick and this is great for this person that asked and uh, they're at school or they're in public places and they're touching surfaces and all that so I found that by eating really high quality foods consistently so the whole foods lots of nutrient rich foods filled with vitamins anything strong with vitamin C and any of the other major vitamins that you need lots of fruits and vegetables as fresh as possible uh, making sure that your body is getting enough sleep and getting enough exercise so taking care of yourself all around and drinking lots of water is very importantly when you're around other people making sure that you're washing your hands so not using all this antibacterial stuff but simply just washing your hands I've I've actually heard that that's more effective than these antibacterial soaps and gels and all yes. that stuff. Just wash your hands on a regular basis. Careful when you touch your face and your mouth when you're in public places. Mm -hmm. When you're on an airplane, you know, you don't have much control over where you where you are and who's around you. So we've actually found that drinking lots of water and just staying hydrated is like one of the key things. But I'll also bring immune boosting things. I'll start to take multivitamin supplements, which I don't always take, and I'll take a lot of vitamin C, and I'll just be ultra careful about that sort of thing. Over the years, that has worked for like a charm for me. And I have been in a lot of work environments where other people have gotten sick. Almost everybody around me has been sick except for me. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that is, of course, an anecdotal response here but that has been my personal experience and um, the experience of many around me how about you all right so I agree with everything you said and I'll just go on record to say you don't need flu shots it's optional this is an option because anytime we're injecting anything intravenous into our bodies we are we are assimilating it at a much quicker rate right when we inject something directly into our bloodstream so in in the things that I've read I personally don't get flu shots and I don't get uh, injections because I'm concerned from what I have read about the aqueous suspension in which these injections are created, which can be many times high in things like mercury and heavy metals. I'm not comfortable with putting that in my body. I don't want it in my body. And I'm much more comfortable using natural methods to keep my immunity high. So as Whitney said, I would just want to share with you guys some of my go-to things. During cold and flu season, when that goes on the news, panic, panic button gets hit. Whenever I just start to feel a little dip or I'm traveling a lot, here's my arsenal. I will do oil of oregano, mm -hmm. colloidal silver. I'll do this amazing product called Kung Fu Tonic, which you could make on your own. You yes. can do fresh organic lemon juice, apple cider vinegar, fresh garlic, and cayenne pepper. Mm -hmm. Uh, whether or not you decide to do Manuka honey or not, I don't. That's extremely medicinal. If you want to sweeten this mixture and do it vegan style, you could use a little bit of organic stevia. Um, but those things, colloidal, oil of oregano, lemon juice, cayenne pepper, garlic, all those things, potent, potent immune boosters. And as far as vitamin C goes, there's a product out there called lipospheric vitamin C. This is an extremely potent form of vitamin C. I took it recently after an oral surgery where they wanted me to take a minimum of three to 5,000 milligrams a day. I found for me it was much more effective than powdered vitamin C or pill vitamin C because this is actually created with nanoparticles in this vitamin C. It's a vegan product. The absorption rate is much higher than a standard vitamin C. It's consequently about three times the price. But if you really, really want to blast the vitamin C, that's a great product. So I agree with Whitney wholeheartedly. There's some amazing, really effective products out there and you just create your own medicine cabinet. And these products are small enough where you can have a traveling medicine cabinet. So if I'm traveling, I put it in a plastic pouch and as I'm going through the x-ray machine or go about to pass through it, I just say hand check and they actually will take these things out and hand check them and you can go on the plane with them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if you're on the plane, ton of water, like she said, I'll actually put a little bit of oil of oregano and uh, chlorophyll into my water and yeah. spray your face with colloidal silver. Yeah. Just spray your whole face, ears, yeah. in your nose, in your mouth, golden. Yeah. Golden. And I just came off of two plane trips. You got sick after traveling. I did. That was due to lack of sleep though. See, right? Lack of sleep lack is of sleep. massive. Lack of sleep. Massive. I rarely get sick after traveling on planes and even during, you know, the the winter season, the cold season, all of that. And again, I'm always mindful of drinking lots of water. Yes. And I like to take essential oils with me too. So, I use the Well Scent essential oils and they actually have a couple anti uh 
I don't know if they call them bacterial, anti-macro, something, anti-something. And I put those on around my hands to make sure my hands stay clean. Essential oils are phenomenal for, an, for getting rid of uh, bacteria. And I'll put them under my nose. And I just, I, I just also stay in kind of this zone of, of not being stressed out because stress yes. can lead to it too. So that would be the last yes. thing I would say is, is just not to be too concerned and not to be too stressed. And sleep, water, and healthy foods and exercise will do wonders for yeah. you. And as soon as you get home, take a shower too. If you after you've been traveling or at work, just keeping you clean, keeping your your environment clean. In general, that'll work very very well. And if you do get sick, just get, continue that process. Lots of water, lots of sleep, uh, just lots of de-stressing and eating healthy food, and you'll heal really fast in most cases. Yeah. But of course. This is going to differ from person to person, yep. case to case, place to place. So having a doctor that you can trust, someone that's holistic and naturally minded that you can uh, speak with about this is always very helpful to have around because you never know. You, you Things things happen and, and we don't have full control over what we're exposed to, unfortunately, as, as we're learning with the whole uh, Ebola yeah. epidemic right now. I mean... We just don't know sometimes. Two last products just really quick I want to recommend. Um, coconut oil. If you use coconut oil topically, raw, unprocessed coconut oil is naturally antimicrobial, antifungal, antibacterial. It's high in lauric acid. So anything that has a high concentration of lauric acid that's a coconut product is great topically to put on. That's another layer of protection as a moisturizer. Yeah, stay moisturized is helpful. And then a lot of natural cleaners now, one that I use actually, um, as actually a, a super high concentration of rosemary oil. Mm -hmm. They've found that mm -hmm. actually rosemary oil is really effective at killing a high concentration of pathogenic microbes too. So yeah. If you use a rosemary oil in your spray, in your all-purpose spray, clean your countertops, clean your kitchen, clean your bathroom, use that rosemary spray on your doorknobs, really, really great way to keep the home healthy too. Absolutely. All right, we've got one last question, and then we're opening up to any live questions, so get them ready. Put them in the Q&A app on Google+. Plus. The last one is another great transition right here from our last topic. It's from Hannah. Can you recommend foods or supplements that boost immunity? I find myself getting sick every few months and I eat mostly healthy. Hmm. So we just talked about supplements, right? Yes. Or, well, I guess we, we didn't quite get into supplements, but um, supplements in general, we try to avoid, we like to supplement through our food so we don't have to supplement basically, right? However, so, I recently uh, got a blood test, which I still need to put the vlog up about, but I was deficient in certain vitamins, in particular vitamin B and vitamin D I needed to boost up, which are two and critical you nutrients. You elaborate that in that last Q&A, which we'll link to. I did. Yeah. So it may, you, this is really an experimentation. And again, with Whitney's sage advice, if you find a good holistic medical doctor in your area who can really be your go-to person, that's a good point person to have on your side. Yes. There's a lot of factors that go into immunity. As Whitney said, you could be eating super healthy, but here's the thing, diet is in everything. Mm -hmm. If you're stressed out at work, if you're carrying a lot of emotional baggage from a relationship or a friendship or something maybe you're not speaking, emotional or physical stress or lack of sleep can, trust me, can overcome the cleanest diet. Like she said, I got back from the East Coast last week. I was battling something for about three days. I'm winning, which is great. I didn't get knocked out. But food isn't the only part of this equation. You have to be mindful of your stress level. You have to be mindful of getting a solid, in my opinion, at minimum eight hours of uninterrupted sleep. You've got to really make sure that you're hitting all of those marks. It's not just about the food you eat. Certainly, yes. And in terms of what are some of your favorite foods that do boost immunity? Supplements? Though? Yeah, I love... Foods, not supplements. Oh, okay, so foods. Yeah. Uh, things that are super high in vitamin C. If you go to things that are citrus fruits, right? Tangerines oranges, uh, any kind red of bell peppers. red bell peppers are great. Um, of course, scavenging free radicals, any kind of dark berries that have high concentrations of phycocyanins. Those are really the dark pigments that help boost your immunity and scavenge free radicals. So blueberries, blackberries, acai, raspberries, get those dark berries in your smoothie, gonna boost your immunity that way too. Um, if you really want to kick it up a notch, uh, it's not technically a supplement. It is a food, although it's a powder. Is Kamu Kamu powder. Really tart. It's a Peruvian berry that they grind into a powder. Other than the cockadoo plum, which is native to New Zealand, which you can't really find, uh, it's the highest known source, highest concentration of vitamin C in any food in the world. And you can put that in your smoothies. Easily. What's that smoothie that you've been loving while you were sick? 
Oh, this is great. So you take strawberries, mango, coconut water, camu camu, a little bit of lemon juice, and the sweetener of your choice. I mean, the coconut water is already pretty sweet. You blend that up, super high in vitamin C, delicious, and it ask, actually masks the super tart camu flavor a lot, but you still get the benefit of that vitamin C. It's amazing. We would love to hear from you too. If, if any of you watching have some favorite immune boosting foods that you're go to when you're not feeling well to, or to pre prevent uh, any sickness. And of course, anything else that you want to add to things that we said. Now we're going to jump into a few live questions and then we're going to head off to the Oktoberfest. Yeah. I'm very excited about that. Okay. Let's take a look and see if we got any today. Okay, so we have one so far, and if anyone else wants to chime in, we will be here for you. And again, that's at Google plus dot, or google.com plus, plus symbol eco vegan gal. If you're having trouble finding the link, you can get it directly from the eco vegan gal Facebook page as well as Twitter. Okay, so Daryl asked, he wants to know your thoughts oh, on hey, seedless grapes and melons that are organic. And yes, he did ask this to I me, and, this and I said, you need to ask Jason about this, because Jason's very passionate about seedless organic foods. So yeah. share with us. Daryl, thanks for the question. I appreciate your, your diligent follow-up on that. So my opinion is thus. Um, hybridization of foods, I think, was done to... Uh, by farmers, and, and this has been happening for centuries, like hybridization, and hybridization, I just want to make a point, is different than genetic modification, okay? Hybridization is taking two different seeds, and and when I say splicing them together, I mean not in a laboratory, I mean farmers literally cross, you know, cutting seeds and putting them together because they're seeing certain traits in one food and certain traits in another part of their crop, and they're trying to create a whole new variation of their crop. So there's nothing genetically modified technically about it. Farmers have been doing this way before laboratory, laboratories even existed. Genetic modification is where they're taking genes from a completely separate species, like flounder or trout or animal DNA, and injecting it in a laboratory and putting it actually into the seed, thereby creating something that's never even existed in nature before, nor in my opinion was ever intended to exist. So big difference between a farmer taking two seeds and putting them together and creating a variant of say watermelon versus scientists in a lab injecting fish genes into a tomato, two separate things. However, I don't like to eat hybridized foods or seedless foods because my opinion is, I haven't seen any specific research studies yet and I need to go into this, but, um, I think energetically, okay, a seedless fruit, there's no reproductive capacity going on in this, right? So the energetic capabilities, in my opinion, of these fruits are not going to be as nutrient dense, not as energizing as the seeded variety. My whole thing is, I guess on an intuitive level, I kind of feel like if I'm eating a seedless fruit, what's that doing to my body? Might that make me seedless? I don't know. There haven't been any studies on this. It's just an opinion. Mm. I like to eat as heirloom as possible all the time, right? As close to the original seed that's been passed down, unaltered, unhybridized for generations through farmers. I mentioned that a few questions back with the heirloom wheat, right? If you find a farmer who's been in the business for years using the same seeds his father used, his grandfather used, you know the integrity of that seed, the nutrient value of that seed is so powerful. I'm just not a fan of hybridized foods. Um, I also find that the flavor isn't as potent. I'll give you a great example. I was in Costa Rica for the first time almost 10 years ago, and I tried an heirloom banana off the tree in the middle of the jungle of Costa Rica. It had big seeds. Like it had palpably big seeds in the middle of this banana. It was so sweet and so just the flavors were bursting. It had these big seeds in the middle. You come back to the States and you see the bananas here that have been hybridized to death. The seeds are so tiny, they're like microscopic little flecks. And it's almost like a starchy flavor yes. in bananas now. Yep. If you try an heirloom banana off the tree, a tree that's been there for decades, maybe even who knows how many years, the flavor is completely different. So for me, I don't like food that's been messed with too much. And I also prefer the flavor of heirloom seeded grown food. It just tastes better. So again, I wish I had research to back this up, Daryl. For me, it's a flavor thing. And it's also just feeling like the energetic and nutritive properties of a food that is heirloom is just going to be better than a seedless. And I don't know. I mean, who knows? Maybe there will be a study. Maybe I need to fund a study whether or not seedless fruits and foods uh, sterilize people. I just feel weird about a seedless watermelon. It doesn't feel natural to me. 
-hmm. Watermelons are not supposed to be seedless. It's a fruit. The definition, the botanical definition of fruit is something that has internal yeah. seeds. Yeah. Right? So if watermelon doesn't have seeds, it's not technically a fruit. What is it? Botanically, what is it? We have no definition for it. It's just weird to me. Yeah. That's an um, amazing perspective. And I, I think that it just kind of comes back around to this place in, in society that we're in where we're so after convenience. Yes. And we want things to be easier. And so it's like, what shortcuts can we take? And how can we, you know, it, we're playing with nature. And some will say we're playing God too much. And it, I, I would agree. It's like, I personally would so much rather have a natural life and be respectful of the earth and my body and then go after something just because I have to pick seeds out of out of something, right? Which have been there for thousands and right. thousands and, and thousands of years. And they're there for a reason, right? <laughs> exactly. I mean, we, that's the thing with nature is nature is has its purpose, right? Everything has a reason behind it. And I think when we are products of nature and then we're trying to take our minds and say, well, let's change it. Let's make it better. Anytime we try to change something that's been there for so long, it's, it, I mean, I guess that's such a huge generalization, but I guess, you're, I guess my point is pretty clear is it just, if we try to manipulate it to something too much, there's a danger involved. Absolutely. And we, you know, like when you look at any films, that's such a huge topic of stories and films and all of that, the butterfly effect and all these different things that us trying to manipulate something that wasn't supposed to be manipulated, right. it doesn't usually have a good result. So instinctually, it just kind of feels, mm, I would rather have, go for the, the other option. And yeah. sadly, you know, a lot, of, it's actually getting harder and harder to get seeded watermelon, it's, which it's is bizarre. interesting. It's bizarre, actually. So, it, you know, the, <laughs> it all comes down to supply and demand as well. So we have a personal responsibility for asking for things, for demanding with our dollar what for the things that we want, right? And that's why shopping at smaller natural markets, shop, getting growing around food, getting things from farmers markets, supporting these more natural ways of getting food is usually when we're gonna eat more naturally. Absolutely. When you eat at big box stores, unfortunately, big box supermarkets and big chains and all that, they're going after the, the average person and the average person wants convenience over over anything else. The other point I wanted to make is actually by eating seedless foods, you're throwing away a whole component of the fruit that can be quite beneficial, in particular watermelon seeds and even more so papaya seeds. Whenever I make a papaya smoothie, I'll actually throw some of the really hard black seeds in with the smoothie because I've read that it actually can help mm -hmm. uh, be an intestinal cleanser. There are certain intestinal parasites and certain things that can be helped to cleanse out of your tract by eating those papaya seeds. So even if I, if I make a watermelon smoothie, if a few seeds get in, I'm not worried about it. It actually has a great benefit to your body. And now there's, what company is that that's selling watermelon seeds as snacks? Oh, I can't remember, yeah. What's their name? Raw something, they make yeah, all the raw Yeah, watermelon snacks. seeds. And you've actually living seen- Is it Living Intention? Or is it Go Raw? Or is it go Raw, I think, it's Go Raw. So yeah. good. Yeah, they make dried watermelon seeds, right? And people eat go. dried pumpkin seeds. And even avocado seeds Pomegranate have a ton seeds. of nutrients in them. So yeah it's, yeah, it's really fascinating. I think that we just have to think a, a little, ironically, outside of the box. Mm -hmm. We you know, go against what all this convenience factor is. If it seems too convenient, it probably is not so great for us. And there's us. been a compromise. Yeah, somewhere. I mean, if, if you're taking a shortcut, you're taking a shortcut in your health in a lot of ways. Right. Thank you for asking, Daryl. Okay, Kelly asked, hi, Kelly. Hey, Kelly. Kelly is one of my rock star editorial team members right now, working away on my book for all of you. And Kelly, I just, I love Kelly so deeply, so. You'll be hearing a lot about Kelly soon because I need to just keep passing on the, the good energy towards her. Okay, so Kelly asked, what does Jason eat to boost his adrenals? He mentioned the importance of lowering our overall stress. Yeah, great, great question. question. Yeah, uh, KLOB in the hizzy. Uh, appreciate the great question. And as far as adrenals go, um, if you look at something like traditional Chinese medicine, which I, I dabble and I'm by no means a practitioner, but from what I've read and what I've experienced in my own body, that black foods actually have a great response with our adrenal glands and can help to lower stress. So black beans, 
black sesame seeds in particular. Any kind of black colored food, something about the pigmentation in black foods really help to energetically boost our adrenal function. The other thing I would recommend is if you are consuming any kind of caffeinated products, even minute amounts of caffeine, that would be raw cacao or chocolate got to eliminate it. Any things like mate or caffeinated teas. If you're serious about your adrenal function or you're feeling the jitters, I would really uh, be strict about eliminating any potential caffeine or um, uh, any kind of adrenal boosters out of your diet. The other big thing too is of course rest, 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 but meditation. Um, they have done studies, actual clinical studies, as far as the stress response and the cortisol levels, because when you get stressed, the one hormone that gets boosted more than, than all of them is cortisol. So meditation, if you can take out 15 minutes, just 15 minutes a day to sit still and just practice being still, right? Creating a safe, sacred, quiet space, even if it's just a corner of your house, getting a comfortable cushion to sit on or even a chair to begin with, taking 15 minutes to close everything out, the cell phone's off, the computer's off, take 15 minutes to meditate, Daily meditation has been an amazing, amazing way for me to lower stress in my life. Um, and also walking, the simple act of walking they found reduces cortisol levels in the body, is actually helpful for, for a healthy heart as well. So walking, meditation, reducing caffeine, and starting to eat those black pigmented foods are the ways that I've helped to uh, reduce my overall stress level. That's great. Now I have a major craving for black beans. That sounds <laughs> so good right now for some reason. I love that. That's that's a phenomenal topic, and not a lot of people talk about all those different aspects. And of it. B vitamins too. Any kind, especially B six, B twelve, really, really helpful in reducing stress levels. In particular, something about B vitamins. Thank you for asking that, Kelly. Thank you for that excellent answer. Let's take one last question. Is that and actually Taylor Swift? No. Come oh on now. <laughs> I mean, it might be. Hey, someone, Taylor. Someone. Glad you're a fan. <laughs> Check it out. Shake it up, uh, 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 shake it up. We did just great, great job. Yeah. We really like the new song. Yeah. Yeah. We do. If you ever want to come over, have a potluck. Yeah. We're, we're here. And we found out we're now we're one person removed from Taylor Swift now. One of our friends was hanging out with her. Cool. Yeah. I'm actually She's gonna really do this cool. dance when I meet her. She'll probably laugh. She was really good on Saturday Night Live. If you guys haven't seen I Taylor think Swift, she's incredibly talented. She's really funny. Yeah, I really like Taylor. Yeah, Swift. kudos Taylor. Okay, we had another question that disappeared, so I don't know if someone accidentally deleted it, but they were asking about headaches and migraine relief. Oh, headaches and migraine relief, yeah. Um, that's a touchy subject because there can be a lot of things that contribute to headaches and migraines. And since, again, mm -hmm. I'm not a degreed medical professional, that's a, a very generalized question. However, I have done my own research. Uh, when I was working with a celebrity client years ago, uh, an associate we were working on a film with was having headaches and I actually gave her liquid magnesium. Liquid magnesium is an amazing thing for a lot of reasons. Liquid magnesium, first of all, is more potent than dried or pill form magnesium. It helps to lower stress levels. It helps to calm you down before you sleep. It helps you sleep like a baby. And while a lot of people want to build bone health, it's not actually calcium you need. What they found is magnesium gets converted to calcium in the body. Yeah. So a lot of people are calcium, calcium, calcium. You need more magnesium. And most Americans, the number one mineral they're most deficient in, magnesium. We are critically magnesium deficient. So um, for Kelly's response, back to stress-lowering uh, foods, magnesium is a great one. Uh, and also, magnesium has been shown to help reduce migraines. They did a study years ago with migraine sufferers, and they found that the great majority of them were actually low in magnesium deficient. So try out liquid magnesium and maybe see if it helps with the headaches. That'd be my first recommendation. And food sources of magnesium uh, um, are actually uh, raw chocolate, high in magnesium, and also pumpkin seeds as well. Excellent. Yeah, I've... I've Read, I continuously come across lots of research on natural ways to get rid of headaches. And it's, I haven't found like one source that says one, and magnesium comes up a lot, but it's like, there's always something new coming out about it. But you're right, it, it just really depends on so many different factors. It depends on your environment. It can depend on your genetics. It can depend on your overall diet, your stress levels, like so many different things. And I, I think that it, it's kind of a, 
elimination type of a thing. And I would know? say too, depending on the type of headache, uh, for me, when I do get the rare headache, and this past week I had some major, major headache action going on. It was actually a, stri uh, I'm sorry, a sinus headache. So for me, um, making sure that my nasal passages are clear, especially if you travel as much as we do for work and, and business, this year, actually the rest of the year is gonna be a lot of travel, using either a neti pot or a sterile saline spray. So again, depending on the type of migraine or headache, depending on whether it's sinus related, keeping your sinus passages clear with that neti pot, with a saline spray, and also getting, check this out. This is a godsend, right? Oh yeah. Okay, this is dope right here. So Olba's inhaler, right? After you do the neti flush, after you're doing the saline spray, really keeping your sinus passages clear, which is especially important after you get off a flight. Mm -hmm. Because if you're on a flight- Or on your flight. You're getting all that recycled gross air and microbes and things, and you're actually getting minute amounts of jet fuel coming in the cabin too, which is not so good for your congestion. Do that saline flush, do that neti pot, and do one of these, right? Mm -hmm. And I was born with the nostrils to do this. I mean, I was just <laughs> kind of born that way. Right, easy for me. So good. It Those essential amazing. oils. So keeping your sinus passages clear may help with your headaches and your migraines too. Yeah. Just a way to experiment with it. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so we'll take this last question from Kelly, who had a follow-up. What plant-based foods do each of you find to calm anxiety? Is there any food either of you eat that actually, as you are ingesting it, calms you? Yeah. As you are ingesting, it calms you. As you are, that's a pretty, that's pretty quick acting there, Kelly. Um, as you are ingesting it. Um, again, I mean, I go back to magnesium, liquid magnesium in particular. There's one brand that I love. It's called Mineral Life. Um, they make awesome liquid iron, liquid magnesium. Uh, it's the high, highest potency that I found. And again, what I do is I take my magnesium right before bed, especially if I feel like I can't sleep. I'll actually take maybe um, a two ounce shot with a little bit of water and just shoot that down. Um, magnesium is the quickest thing I found for me. Um, but then there's the classic things like, I mean, any type of warm soup like miso soup is very, very calming. Uh, peppermint is classically calming and anything that kind of brings down your stress levels. And again, hot tea, like a hot peppermint tea would be really wonderful. Yeah, and also there, um, there are great natural ambience that you can take. Uh, three of my favorite are uh, cherries. So either cherry mm -hmm. juice or when they're in season, actual dark whole cherries, a great ambient. And ambient is just something that helps you sleep. Okay, so it's high in B vitamins, calms your stress levels, calms your adrenal glands. Uh, almonds are great too, if you are not allergic to almonds. Uh, and bananas as well. Those three are great things to eat before you go to bed because they're gonna help calm you down and help you sleep. Yeah, absolutely. And I find that, you know, going back to the meditation point and all of that and, and just remembering to breathe and to be grateful while you're eating and be just take that moment to show gratitude for the food, for your life, for where you are at that moment. Just take that moment to stop. A lot of people like to pray before they eat or they like to close their eyes and just kind of bless their food or give gratitude at the moment. Whatever it is, whatever that practice, that helps so much and that can start to calm you down. I mean, that's a huge purpose of meditation is to, to bring down anxiety. And you can meditate in all these little moments of your life. It doesn't have to be that singular 15 minutes block of time at the beginning of your day it can be throughout your day and I feel like when I do that and I'm eating very high quality nutrient dense foods I naturally just feel less anxiety because my body is getting the nutrients I'm telling my body that everything's okay I'm telling my body that I'm taking care of it and that whole practice starts to calm me down in so many different ways food to me is is just calming in general yeah. But more so when it's less processed because sometimes when you're stressed out, you want the processed foods, you want the sugar and the oils and the salts and all of that, and you'll eat it. And then within minutes, you don't feel any better. Or you might have like this, this quick spike of like, oh, that feels so much better now. But then it goes away and then you feel more stressed than you were before. Exactly. So for me, finding alternatives to that and having natural sweeteners and having just rich food that's rich with nutrients with vitamins and minerals and fiber and water and, and that's just nourishing you inside and I think that your body just has a natural tendency to relax. And here's the other point I want to make about that. When you're in a state of stress, 
your body is uh, in an acidic state. So it's important if you're stressed consistently to eat more alkaline foods. And you can easily just go buy or even print off from the internet a chart of acid and alkaline foods and keep that on your fridge, right? And if you're stressed out, don't reach for the acidic foods because you're already in an acidic state, right? It's just going to keep making you more acidic. What you want to do is buffer that acidity by eating more alkaline foods. That's another one. And the thing that they found, Whitney, in research is people that have a lot of sugar cravings are highly, highly either dehydrated or under mineralized. Mm. So if you have a higher level of good organic minerals in your diet, you just might find you crave sweets less. And when you're under those stressful conditions, which can actually rob minerals from your body, you're not going to reach for those sweets all the time. Mm -hmm. So try, mm -hmm. high, you know, maybe even go get a blood test and see if you're low in certain minerals. Yes, a blood test, of course, is if you're experiencing different levels of, of poor health, a blood test, and just a consultation with a really knowledgeable nutritionist, doctor, holistic-minded uh, professional is really going to help you because that's going to give you the specific answers that your body needs. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we're going to wrap that up today. Thank you so much for everybody for sending in the questions that we addressed earlier and for asking the live questions. This has been such an enlightening thing. I always learn so much from just simply answering your questions, from having guests on, and from hearing what you have to say about various topics. It's It's so wonderful and i hope that you've been enjoying this too please give this video a thumbs up if you like it and leave comments jump in the conversations here add your opinion in if you do have a question for a future q a remember to use the link in the description field and while you're there you'll find links to ecoveegangal.com and jasonrobell.com you'll find links to social media networks where we'd love to connect with you and connect you with other like-minded people you'll also find links to our newsletters that you can sign up for so that you get weekly inspiration and education and, and anything that's going to help you with your journey to being as healthy as, and happy as possible. So we, again, just want to thank you. And do you have anything else to say? Any other closing words? Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, I'm just, I'm, I'm laughing because Taylor Swift still wants us to video know, chat with her. I know. Well, it's very, very sweet. Whoever the Taylor Swift is commenting away we we appreciate you being so adamant and if you'd like you can you reach can out to us and you, send us an email you can send us a direct email for a sure message or something we would love to hear from you if you want to go to shojin and you want a tour guide to the restaurants yeah. of la totally we can go to karaoke and we don't have to sing your songs we could sing like 80s hits yeah yeah we could do that well yeah journey mm -hmm. queen john mellencamp you still need to go to karaoke with, by the way, that's a whole nother topic because our karaoke date is overdue. Eat pastry, no. Jesse has told us yes, she's coming to LA. Yes. That's another subject. So maybe there'll be a secret <laughs> undercover video with Eco Vegan Gal karaoke coming soon. Maybe. No, no. <laughs> Grab the mic, yeah. All right, we're gonna end things. I will see you next Saturday and we will also love to see you on our YouTube channels. Jason's got some incredible recipes, tell them, Tell them that upcoming recipe that I'm really excited okay. about. Okay, so I, I think this is the one last night that you were like, no way. Okay, so for Halloween on my channel, Jason Robelt TV, I'm going to have vegan dirt cups with organic gummy worms. Dirt pudding. Dirt, uh, dirt, dirt cups. Dirt whatever, dirt, dirt pudding. Dirt cups sound... Dirt, it's dirt pudding. <laughs> Sorry, I, you know, here's the weird thing. I've never actually had the old school one. Really? So I, I this is my whole, this is my first time even making it. So yes, I'm sorry. Whoa. Dirt pudding. It's amazing. There's actually one waiting for you that you get to try, but it's amazing. So for Halloween, I've got a special dirt pudding vegan style recipe on the J Row show. Vegan gummy worms in it. Correct. Correct. I'm really excited to try it and to see your recipe because I bet it's really fun. It is fun. Yeah. You've got your videos are just getting better and better. Thank you. They I appreciate are. that. So if you guys haven't checked out his channel yet. J Row Show, Jason Robel TV. Subscribe. Yeah. Good stuff over there. It's it's very entertaining and educational at the same time. There's music, there's food, there's the occasional guest. It's always there's fun. the occasional cat. There's the <laughs> yeah, there is the occasional cat, yes. <laughs> Those cats need their own YouTube channel, I'm telling you. They'll get it. Thumbs up if you guys want a, him to start a YouTube channel for his cats. <laughs> okay, we're going to go. I'll see you next week, and I'll see you online in the meantime. Thanks, Whitney. <laughs> Bye. See you guys.